Uh, welcome to At the Pass, a conversation with Stone Barns resident chefs Shola Olunloyo and Bill Yosis. My name is Kira. I work in development at Stone Barns. And I wanted to start off this program by thanking our Stone Barns members and donors for your ongoing support. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces and names here this evening. And I'd also like to welcome those of you who will be joining chefs Shola and Bill in the dining room to experience their interpretation of the farm's landscape. And I hope those of you who aren't members will consider supporting us in the future. If you have any questions or you're interested in joining, we put some information in the chat so you can check that out in the chat bubble. And with that, I'll turn it over to Irene Hamburger, Stone Barn Center's Director of Education. Thank you all. Thanks, Kira. We're so excited that everybody's here. I know a few uh, of you joined us last week with uh, the conversation with Bill and Shola, and we're going to go deeper, deeper into the conversation around fermentation today and how that influences the menu and the work that Chef Shola and Chef Bill uh, work, work together to create. Um, but first, I just want to introduce who's going to be speaking tonight. Um, I'm going to start with Chef Courtney Burns. Um, and according to her Instagram profile, she is a collector of flavors, a co-author of James Beard award-winning book, Bar Tartine, and has a new book that has just recently been published called Nourish Me Home. And it's really a fantastic cookbook. Um, her hashtag is love is the new mother sauce. And I just got off a call where she was enthusiastically referred to as the greatest preservationist in the world, which is pretty wonderful since she leads Blue Hill and Stone Barn Center's preservation efforts. And um, Bill Yosis, Chef Bill Yosis, one of my favorite things about him, among my many favorite things about Bill, is that the first line of his Wikipedia page, which is William Yosis is an American chef who is best known as co-author of the book, Desserts for Dummies, and paired with that, and for being the White House Executive Pastry Chef for 20, from 2007 to 2014. That's a big, a big uh, uh, difference between two incredible uh, pieces of work. Other things I learned from his Wikipedia page, he is a master, he has his master's in French language, and President Obama has said, whatever pie you like, he will make it, and it will be the best pie you have ever eaten. And I can attest to that. Uh, but more importantly, in recent years, Bill has dedicated his work to creating food literacy by teaching young children and adults about the value of eating better. And Chef Shola Olanoyo, Nigerian chef Shola Olanoyo is a distinguished member of the Philadelphia restaurant community with a reputation for highly technical food and exciting flavors. Schooled both in England and Nigeria, he continued his culinary studies in a series of apprenticeships and stages across Europe, East and Southeast Asia, working at some of the most formative restaurants in the industry. Along the way, he cultivated up a phenomenal library of techniques, flavors, and traditions with a special emphasis on fermentation. A culinary jack of all trades, Olomoyo has worked in food writing and catering. In 2002, he opened the Culinary Laboratory Studio Kitchen, where he experiments with culinary concepts, flavors, and cutting edge technology. In his kitchen, he works with restaurants and food equipment manufacturers to develop new ideas towards deliciousness. During his residency, Shola will reinterpret the bounty of the Hudson Valley through his, the lens of Yoruba, Nigerian cuisine, highlighting the rich and complex flavors that make up the coastal region. And now I'm going to turn the evening over to Courtney and to Bill and to Shola, and we're all going to learn a tremendous amount about fermentation. We're going to speak for about another 20 minutes please put your questions in the chat and we will wrap up the evening with some conversation between all of us. Great, thank you, Irene and Kira for getting us off to an amazing start here. And welcome Shola and Bill. I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna kind of do a little deep dive um, into the world of preservation through the lens of both stone barns and the agriculture that we have there and through the culinary 
uh, landscape of both Shola and Bill and their cuisine. So super excited to have this conversation with them tonight and to be engaged with them uh, in the way that we get to be during this residency. So, all right, let me, all right. So we all know where we are and what we're doing here. We're gonna look at many different techniques tonight. And if you have questions like Irene said, throw them in the chat, we can kind of add to this as we go, but we're gonna go through a myriad of different techniques that we use within the kitchen at Stone Barns of Blue Hill. Um, and that Shola is also deeply ingrained in. So there's an amazing cross-pollination that's already happening between all these techniques that we all employ and then the different ways that we get to see how they're used and the different ways that the same technique can be layered in to create more flavors within, you know, very different cultures and cuisines. Mm -hmm. So it's super exciting for us to get to have this um, exchange. So one thing we're gonna talk about is lactic fermentation. Uh, one of the main techniques that we use at Blue Hill and Stone Barns is just taking the, the, the amazing produce that we get from super microbial rich soil, which is the first part of making a good ferment, is uh, the soil that the vegetables are grown in. We take those and it's really just a transformation through salt and water um, and through all the microorganisms involved there that create a super probiotic rich, gently soured uh, ferment that is preserved for later use. So Shola and I have been talking, he can kind of touch this. There's not really a large lactic fermentation culture in Nigeria, but he's taken these flavors and layered them into his cuisine in an interesting way. So it, you'll see this if you've eaten already, you'll see this in the goat dish. If you haven't, you'll be experiencing this. So Shola, can you touch on this technique a bit? Well, uh, we don't actually lactic ferment in Nigeria. As, as you mentioned, but the elements of fermentation and tang in other aspects of cuisine, and to the degree that things form basis of vinaigrette, soups, stock, sauces, it becomes sort of a one of the important uh, flavor parameters, certainly balanced with other flavor components to make the food have its specific imprint. If you look at it, it's almost like listening to an orchestra with like the different instrument sections which make the composition of the music but any one removed gives a vastly different experience absolutely and just a few examples of lactic ferments of those that may not be quite familiar with it if you think of you know classic dill pickles fully soured sauerkrauts um fermented like kimchi is things like that. So these things that are kind of part of our everyday culinary lexicon um, these days are all naturally lactic uh, fermented foods. It's good to get a little bit of those in our diets every day. It doesn't have to be a lot. And these are the ones that if you do go shopping for them, if you're not making them are in the refrigerated section because they do help to populate our gut with really healthy bacteria, which keeps us healthy, strong and allows our immune system to function in the most um, robust way that it can. So. That's my plug for everyone eating a little bit of fermented foods every day. So next one here, we have acetic acid preservation, which is far more common from what Shola has been sharing with us in um, Nigerian cuisine. Uh, when we think of this, it's, it's basically a vinegar preservation. So there's a two-step process coming in here. The vinegar is what is being actually fermented. That's being made out of, let's say fruit juice, which then turns into, let's say wine for an example, or apple juice that turns into cider, which then is transitioned into um, acetic acid, which forms the base that allows us to then preserve in it. So we use that as the medium for preservation, uh, but it's already been fermented previously. So we can do quick pickles with it. And one of the um, examples of that is pickled peanuts and they're being used as a garnish on Sholo's potato ice cream, which will tell us a little bit more about. Well, the potato ice cream was a way to sort of uh, uh, start from two concepts. One was just to start from the earth and also to highlight important agricultural crops. Tubers, tubers, potatoes, yams of various sorts are uh, important to West African cuisine because to provide a backbone of starch and you know uh, volume to the food. And also our peanuts as a cash crop. So I thought it would be nice to do a, 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 an ice cream based on potatoes. Uh, even though early in the meal, it might seem a little like rich and presumptuous which is why we pickle the peanuts to add a flavor counterpoint 
and balance the richness and oil with some acid. Uh, having a pickle base, I, I, I can't claim to be the first person who's made a pickle base, but I like pickles in some cases that are kind of like consistent with like my time in terms of coming up with an idea and executing it. So the pickle base is just everything you would use to make a pickle except the actual substance itself. So you could actually take this liquid and vacuum seal a cucumber with it and come back the next day and you have reasonably what would have been like a 24 day dill pickle. So we have to balance the natural processes, but also with available technology can do some fairly clever things to speed up the process while maintaining the integrity of like the point, you know, the dish, the, the balance of flavors. One of the things we're always talking about um, in the kitchen at Blue Hill is this way of creating a seasonless kitchen. And it's not as though we want to eat tomatoes in the middle of winter, but we do want to be able to capture and coax out all of the flavors and the nutrients uh, that are available to us at the height of the season, you know, when fruits or things like that are, um, are coming in in a glut. And so we do preserve a lot of those in pickle base. And I just want to throw this over to Bill for a moment to kind of share how uh, Bill, share with us how you've been using some of the pickled fruit in your desserts in a really dynamic way. Thank you. Yes. Um, so it becomes uh, a great counterbalance, as Shola mentioned, in, in the ice cream dish, but also in the, um, in the desserts, we're, we're not using any refined sugar. Um, and yet we're finding sweetness in some of the vegetable dishes like the, the winter spinach from the greenhouse. Um, the stalks of that spinach are extremely sweet. And so we make a soup out of it without adding any sugar. And so this pickling of the fruits, which are stone barn fruits, um, provide a nice contrast to that. And our idea is to really kind of change the image of dessert and the experience of dessert from one that's heavily relies on sugar and sweetness to another strong experience. And that experience can be pickling, it can be this acidic touch of vinegar, or um, in the case of the soup, a very strong chlorophyll flavor. Um, these, are, these are all really sort of dominant and intense flavors and we hope that's a great way to finish the meal. Thanks, Bill. One thing to note, all of these techniques, which most of you probably know are, are older than and all of us combined. And so the beauty of this is we're really just honoring and respecting you know, tried and true techniques in order to preserve food for one out of necessity, but also to really revel in the kind of delicious jubilation that we get from them. So first and foremost, this is necessity meets creativity through the kitchen. Um, and it's beautiful to see these two chefs work with it. Uh, Can I jump in on that point? Uh, because the, the traditional use of fermentation, I think is really, uh, is fascinating. As you said, how old it goes. And um, I wanna refer you to, uh, a gentleman named Patrick McGovern, Professor Patrick McGovern at the University of Pennsylvania, who first discovered the first use of wine at a site in Turkey. And I highly recommend his book. He he's, calls himself a biomolecular archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they actually discovered this fermented liquid in Turkey, and they know it wasn't vinegar, it was actually wine by, by doing their um, genetic research. Uh, so I recommend that book to anybody who's interested in fermentation. It's well over 10,000 years old. So we'll move on to a little bit more of some esoteric preserves that we do. So black alliums, this is something that Shola's using a lot in the menu. Um, and that we kind of work with as well at Blue Hill. We're able to take things like garlic, shallots, onions. We hold these alliums at a constant temperature, usually like 130 to 140 degrees for two to three weeks. And what that does is it actually renders them extremely sweet, almost molasses-like, licorice-like, transitions the sugars and turns them like absolutely black, as you can see in the pictures here. Um, and it's not a 
fermentive process per se, but it's an enzymatic one. And so through that, uh, we get to layer in all these complexity of flavors and Shola uses them in some of the most dynamic ways that I've seen used in the kitchen. This one is used to garnish the carrot soup. So Shola, do you want to tell us about this amazing spice mix that you've made? Well, so I like black alliums and on a base level, you get a very specific flavor. Like for example, black garlic is just such a transformative ingredient in, in relation to its original source garlic. So if you can you know, generally they're used in, in ways where it, it's about that transformation, like someone would make a black garlic ketchup or like a black garlic marinade or barbecue sauce. But I find that for me, it's much more interesting balance with other things, but not just to use black garlic as an ingredient, but also to think that the blackening process can be attached to other more compound spices that include the garlic. So black alliums, like for example, our garnish on the soup includes onions, garlic, shallots, a uh, few aromatic leaves like the blossoms of basil, curry leaves, ginger from the greenhouse at Blue Hill. And so as the garlic and the alliums are blackening, they're also fermenting to some degree or combining flavors with the other ingredients, which include aromatic leaves and spices, coriander, cumin. So you come up with a con a very complex spice blend at the end. Like we like to think that nothing is new and everything's been done before, but not everything's been done properly. And so we have to go down these avenues of discovery where we can make different, I think the correct term to use histo uh, historically would probably be a masala in the way the Indians cook, like a spice mix that is destined for a specific purpose. So if you can kind of free yourself of these sort of cultural boundaries of words and just take the process as an inspiration and then use the science of it to come up with something new, it's actually quite rewarding and, and very novel flavors. Would you say that this spice mix is a flavor that you are familiar with from Nigeria, just done in a different way? Or how would you kind of express that sort of uh, cross-pollination? It's a, it's a redux of flavors I'm familiar with from Nigeria. I, I could simply just make blends of spices that were, you know, completely 100% traditional and, and, and they are good. But I think as part of my own cooking outlook and the residency is to sort of flow from the traditional to the contemporary. Uh, we can't really make a case for authenticity cooking African inspired food in the dead of winter in the Hudson Valley. So we have to be creative and be open to interpretation of things. And I think those interpretations very often result in very clever and delicious new flavor patterns. I can speak to that walking through the kitchen these days. Um, it's just a layering of spice mixes and it's just a very welcome aroma in that kitchen. So it leads us to dehydration, which kind of plays into um, the black garlic in some ways. This is a preservation technique that I think is often overlooked when we're talking about, let's say, just like fermentation in general and leaving out some of the preservation. Uh, dehydration has been used for thousands of years as a way, especially in a lot of hot climates, to, to extract water activity from ingredients, concentrate flavors, and then storehouse them for later dates. And Shola uses so many different spice mixes in his cuisine. And I think very traditionally, it's seen in Nigerian cuisine in general, yes? Yeah, so dehydration is obviously just generally used to preserve things by taking them to a state of the lowest water activity so that they can be shelf stable. But if you really think of dehydration in the very novel ways, you know, everybody knows where A is and everybody knows where Z is. But very few people like think about what's happening at X, at J, K, L, M, you know. And that there's some very interesting things that happen, which I'm talking about partial dehydration and talking about dehydration and rehydration. So if you use dehydration in a much more complex thing, way than just removing moisture from something, you can see a lot of other interesting processes. So like you could cook lentils, dehydrate them, and then rehydrate them in tomato water, and then just quickly cook them and serve them as lentils, as dal. And people are kind of blown away by the flavor. They look exactly the same, but you've come up with something that is speaking to 
both the earthiness of the lentil, but like it looks, it tastes like tomato risotto, which is very interesting. So that seems like a circus trick, but it isn't. It just really forces you to look at what the range of dehydration will do. Uh, I've made things like beef jerky, and you know, we all like beef jerky, but you think of beef jerky, it's chewy, it's preserved meat, like what could you do with it? If you dry it enough and shred it enough and blend it enough and mix it with salt, you could make a beef salt. Does a beef salt sound sensible? Probably not until you use it to cross the New York strip and grill it, you know, and then you understand like the insanity of beef on beef, you know, the beef itself is the salt for the beef. You'll see these layering of flavors all over the dishes that Shola makes with the habanada oil on the scallop dish, these different badavans that we're speaking of. Uh, the goat rub is a really dynamic spice mix. He makes a shito, which is uh, like a fermented, um, it's kind of like an exo sauce, if that means anything to people, but this kind of chili um, meat, meat, seafood meets chili sauce, the carrot soup, the pheasant, the tartare, it's everywhere within the cuisine and it really layers in flavors and creates um, just these like flavor sensations that don't definitely don't leave you quickly. So we'll get into some other ones and we don't have a ton of time. So we'll move through some of these, but fermented honey, this is a beautiful way of transitioning flavor in honey and also increasing flavor and, and almost like inculcating the honey with the flavor of the moment. Um, honey itself is shelf stable at about 17 to 18% moisture content when it comes out of the hive. When we add in um, more liquid to it, then we start to ferment it and all these nuanced flavors come out. And Shola has taken Stone Barn's honey from the apiary on site and infused it with African basil honey. He's using that on a roasted carrot dish with pickled carrot vinegar. And you do this with a lot of different ingredients, correct Shola? Yeah, so I like fermented honeys because they allow me to capture the various flavors and aromas that are difficult to either capture or employ during the year. Like there's there's uh, anise hyssop flowers in the summer, which lasts for very few weeks. Uh, one of the most difficult flavors to capture in America or anywhere in the world is the linden blossom. The linden tree will blossom for 3.5 or 4 days and it's done. Unless you get a ladder, climb up the tree and snip them one by one, it's not going anywhere. So that's one of my favorite honey ferments. And you can use that honey all year round in sweet or savory applications. It's fantastic with tea. And we're basically doing the jobs of the bees, which is why we should probably appreciate them a lot more than we give them credit for. And aside from just adding water and if you're adding a lot of uh, floral components to your honey, uh, compared to the amount of honey, that natural yeast will actually activate and ferment that honey for you. So there's a couple different ways of doing it. But like Shola said, it's it's, it's this kind of reciprocal feast that's happening with the fermenting of the honey and using florals for it. And then we get into iru, which is just a mind blowing ingredient. I, we tasted it fresh last week and it's a, I'll let Shola really speak to this, but it's a fermented locust bean. Um, and I've never quite tasted anything like it. We're trying to understand how to use local ingredients from our agricultural surroundings to recreate these layered flavors. Um, and that's really where we keep talking about this cross-pollination that's happening through Shola's residency. It's almost as if we're learning, we are learning these new techniques and feel like we're being given somehow the, the freedom to play with these techniques in a way that doesn't feel uh, disingenuous at all. So we're in gratitude for these new, um, almost like offerings for the kitchen. But Shola, why don't you speak to Iru? It seems like it's one of the most iconic Nigerian ingredients. So Iru is one of the most, uh, important Nigerian ingredients, it's it's the fermented locust bean, and it adds a depth of complexity and flavor to most dishes. So iru itself is not a focal point of a dish. It's just like one of those assists that add flavor and depth and, you know, roundness of flavor. Uh, the fermented flavor will be similar to when you eat a very complex, earthy uh, substance with a little bit of funk. It's almost like the reaction you get when you have, say, like Japanese natto, uh, when you eat, for example, like a really, really complex, authentic Parmesan, Parmigiano Reggiano, but you eat it at room temperature and you let those kind of like 
coagulated salt deposits like crunch slowly when you eat a complex, soft ripened, perhaps unpasteurized cheese from generally France or Italy, but also there's some fantastic ones in America now. You get that backbone of complexity and fun. Like these ingredients define themselves in the sense that sometimes people are turned off by the slight strong aroma in the beginning, but the flavor they contribute to the cooking is completely evident and absent when you don't include it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really an amazing ingredient. And this kind of shows a couple more ingredients that um, Shul is using. It's an And so product. this is like taking those ingredients like iru and other meats and, you know, essentially fermenting them into liquid mediums, which make for easy employ into cooking. You know, you can have teaspoons of one or two things. And again, make a more complex flavor addition medium by you know, taking the complex of meat and, you know, uh, amino fermentation to improve flavor without having to rely on bouillon cubes for everything. And if you come eat Shola's food, you'll experience this uh, flavor and a paste that he makes with it on the scallop dish. And then there's an iru miso, a miso rather, a shoyu, and then the garam is all using the agusi stew, which is just like layer upon layer of flavor. And then shito, which we touched on quickly. This has been, we've taken a bunch of dried fish from our local waterways uh, with some of the waste fed pork from um, stone barns. And she has made it into this absolutely amazing kind of chili paste, which oftentimes is much spicier than this. He's toned it back a bit, bit but does have some spicy components on hand for those who enjoy it. Right. So we'll kind of move into koji here, which forms a lot of the base of uh, Shola's larder. Koji is a very old um, way of inoculating rice or grains with an aspergillus spore, it's a fungus. And it is the base for so many things that we find absolutely delicious, soy sauce, miso, amazake, amongst other things. Um, and it forms the base of the shoyus that are being used, the amino sauces and all of these other um, you know, like flavor enhancers, really, that show up on Shola's menu. And so, I mean, I think that, Shola, my question with that one, and as we move into these garams, we can talk a little bit about these, is although these techniques may not be from Nigeria, from what I've experienced through your food and through talking with you, it's just really that layering of flavor, that layering of umami that really is that backbone of Nigerian cuisine, and you'll you'll get there however however you need to. Would you say that that is accurate? Yeah, it is. I mean, people have to make the distinction between technique and product, you know, just because the Japanese do something doesn't mean it's a, I mean, it, the, the technique is more often used in Japan, but like there are other names for similar techniques, maybe with far less yield in other parts of the world. And so if we can find a higher volume employable technique or fermentation, and apply native ingredients to it. I think that's a completely fair game, you know. I'm not trying to remake Japanese food, but you know, the world is a very dynamic place. There are oceans that flow through and past many continents. There are seaweeds in Japan, there are seaweeds in Africa. And if Africans think they have the ability to harvest seaweed and use it as part of their cuisine, as it is local, I see absolutely nothing wrong with that, even though the inspiration may be from Japan. I love that layering of different cultures and cuisines to, to really harness um, place more than anything, but also layering of flavors. And I just want to touch on when Shil is making these, we're inoculating grains. And so a lot of the grains that he's using are barley, partially because of the flavor profile and the depth of flavor that we get from them. But from an agricultural sense, by us reinvigorating barley as a crop that becomes more part of our everyday culinary lexicon, we not only give farmers the ability to grow that barley, which is often a cover crop, and yield an economic gain from it. But we start to create food-based, you know, kind of a, a human food-based barley culture again, where so much of what's grown these days is for animal feed. So we're really trying to bring back the idea that barley is not only delicious, deeply nutritious, also creating economy for the farmers, 
Um, but it, it, it is a really palatable and amazing food for humans as well. So we love seeing it being used in all of these different uh, ferments. Here's some more of those amazing uh, flavor boosters that Trill is making. This one has uh, West African peanuts and barley koji, some um, barley koji and mushrooms, and then the blackened onions and blackened alliums that we talked about. All again, just kind of layering in flavor to, to dishes throughout the menu. Trill, do you want to talk about this one? So this one again is taking inspiration from making you know, like we, we, we ferment corn in West Africa into sour corn, which is used for pudding. And so, you know, I was searching for many ways to, or other ways to affect that pudding by using, again, natural glutamate sauces and other ferments. Obviously going to corn would be logical since it's already the base flavor. Uh, I experimented with many different kinds of corn and I found that various varieties have different sort of like amino reactions on the on the derivative product. And one of my favorites is the blue corn from Mexico, which is why it says blue pozole. Uh, the, the corn is actually a Mexican varietal and uh, it yields a very interesting, both a miso and, a, and, and a, the, the most amazing tamari I've tasted so far. So the tamari is just the liquid. When we're making miso, it's always pressed really hard. And so there's a liquor that forms at the top. That's traditionally what tamari or shoyu is. There's now a production um, you know, mechanism to make more of that liquid than miso because usually you only get a very, very small amount of it with yeah. every batch of miso you make. So the shoyu that we see in stores is produced in that way. But there's nothing more delicious than the top of a miso shoyu. It is just... It's just it's just a flavor experience. So hope you all get to experience that. Yeah, yeah. And then tasty pastes. These are just again different ways that we use koji, which is an inoculated rice that transitions those starches into free radical sugar. It is just this amazing sweet base that then has the enzymatic capacity to take on other substrates and transition those transition those into even more flavor. So Shell has taken iru and um, I believe there's some black truffles in here and black uh, trumpet mushrooms and koji and let that all work its way together into this paste that is then, um, I'm sorry, painted onto a scallop for one of his dishes. And we let koche, excuse me. So what we know is corn smut, which grows, um, it's a fungus that grows on corn. Again, also tons of umami in that. So he's just taken umami piece after umami after umami and layered it into this, what we call a tasty paste, right. which is a similar form of making like a miso, but it doesn't have a legume in it. And amazake, again, another koji based um, inoculant that is absolutely sweet being used in, as a uh, sweetener, but also is used in the in the agege bread. Shola, can you speak to that bread and how um, this is being used in it? Well, so agege is a basic bread in West Africa. It's made out of mostly refined white flour. But I think the reason most people like it and the purpose it serves is it, its texture. It's just like a big poofy pillow. Mm -hmm. It's like a sponge matrix. It sucks up liquid and it's good for a side accompaniment to stewy or sauce rich dishes. Uh, it's not really a sandwich culture, but again, it, it's similar to something like a pan de meat. So in working with Patrick, the baker at Blue Hill, to come up with a reasonable facsimile based on using whole wheat, one of the structures of trying to get to that texture was to employ amazake as part of the percentage of the volume of the bread, which added a lot of moisture and, and thus replicated the density of the bread to uh, a degree that was, you know, very close, but again, using whole wheat, which is generally a little bit more difficult to work with. One of the amazing thing that's come out of the bakery with this is using this kind of double layer of, you know, this layer of fermentation into the bread process. We've come to see that by adding koji into bread, we almost can't get it to go bad. It has a shelf life that is just absolutely amazing, which is something we're gonna to continue to look into but the agege bread has really spoken to that, a bread that may go stale, you know, within a few days, it's just remaining um, 
absolutely fresh and delicious uh, as it sits there. We're just doing experiments. We are serving it fresh, but we are trying to see if we can get it to go bad. Amazing uh, enzymatic reactions are happening. So again, another koji based um, product. So this is basically just like a smoked koji liquid, salt liquid. Um, it's used in many of the bases uh, and sauces that Shola is creating throughout the menu. It's just another way of using koji to get a, when you want salt, sweet and smoke all at the same time, this is kind of your, you know, one in one and done punch for that. Yep. And on the right, you'll see it's still made with a base that's quite thick. And then this is how it's pressed um, under a lot of weight through these, um, through fabric. And that is most of the techniques, not all that we are using um, throughout the residency. Uh, so we are lucky to have such dynamic um, minds in the kitchen guiding us through all these new and nuanced flavors. So thank you guys so much for all that you're bringing uh, to our kitchen. Thank you. Everybody. And we are running a little bit close to time, but I would just see if there is, are any questions. There was a question, Bill, I think I got the name of the book right about Mr. McGovern's book that you had recommended. I wrote down Uncorking the Past. Was that the book you were referring uh, he has, to? That's his most recent one, Uncorking the Past. The, his original one that made a big splash was Ancient Wine, The Search for the Origins of Viniculture by Patrick McGovern. Okay. And uh, if you're ever in Philly, which seems to be the new center of the universe, um, please visit his uh, museum where he has actual samples of this wine that was created 10,000 years ago. He found them in sealed amphorae in Turkey. And um, unfortunately, he's afraid to drink them because he doesn't know what else is, you know. but uh, he's a fascinating guy and shows how old the fermentation process is. We have just a few more minutes. So if there are any questions, please either feel free to you know, jump in or type them in the, up. Oh, here we go. Is there a practical way to make the blackened vegetables, fruits at home, 130 degrees for three weeks? Seems tough. Yes, there is actually, it's super easy. You're actually going to laugh. So one of the things we do as cooks is to find existing technology that solves the problem without having to buy any specific device. So what you need to do, and if you follow up with Stone Barns, I will send you the specific brand and model of, you have to go buy a rice cooker. And as you know, rice cookers, you put rice and water in them, you plug them in, and the orange light comes on. That is the light that keeps the rice warm after you've cooked it. To cook the rice, you press the button down, it cooks the rice, and the button pops back up. The warming section, if you fill it with garlic cloves and close it and leave it plugged in for 30 days, at 30 days you will have black garlic. Done, that's it. Wonderful, any other questions? We have a few more minutes. I agree with Caitlin who just wrote, that's wild. I think that's amazing. <laughs> It's trying to make life easy. It's interesting to note too these a lot of these ingredients because so many chefs and other people are getting wind of how delicious they are. I absolutely encourage everyone to make them at home, but it's also something that you can find fairly readily available um, on the internet these days too. So if it's something you want to taste and see if you love it before you spend maybe three weeks making it, um, you definitely can. But by all means, uh, making it, you know, making things ourselves by hand is what we do. But it's the other, these flavors are available to you otherwise as well. Okay. Wonderful. If there are no more questions, I'm going to turn it over to Kira for some final thoughts. Shola, Bill, Courtney, thank you so much. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That was so great. Um, Courtney, Shola, and Bill, just hearing about your fermentation work and experiments. I have to say the koji and bread is so interesting. Um, I love hearing about that kind of uh, experimentation. So 
And thanks again to all of you for supporting us and joining this conversation. Um, if you have interest in further supporting the work, I hope you'll consider joining as a member. Members are also able to follow all of the resident chefs throughout their weeks on the farm um, with programs like this and more to come. And uh, also members do receive a 10% discount on the Chef Olin Loyo residency box that really transforms our farm product into a take home meal designed by Chef Shola. So if you have any questions around these opportunities, again, I put my information in the chat. Um, so feel free to email me and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, chefs. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye.